offering stuff. So, um, but, um, and, and um, Taylor, did you hit, you hit the recording button. So that's good. Thank you. Yeah. Um, no, good. But Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, I think I know most of you, but if not, my name's Amy Skillman, and I'm the director of the MA in Cultural Sustainability here at Goucher College. And uh, before we begin, I'm just going to go over some quick reminders. We do have closed captioning available if you click on the CC button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we are recording this, so if you prefer not to be on screen, please just simply turn off your video. Um, in the meantime, though, please keep your um, microphone on mute until we open it up for questions and conversation, which won't be very long, but uh, we want to, um, and you might want to even keep your setting on speaker view so that you just have um, the speaker and whatever's up on the screen. These events are designed as conversations. So we'll have some opening remarks and then Selena will offer a presentation and we'll, then we'll have a moderated dialogue. We encourage you to communicate with each other using the chat function, but to please hold your questions um, until, until the end when we open it up for dialogue. Um, uh, so, you know, go ahead and start chatting now if you like and just say something about why you're here, um, who you are and why you're here. And um, and then I'll just uh, while you're doing that, I'll, I'll give you a little bit more background information. So this I'm pleased to welcome you to the first of four uh, free online sessions in our fall chat fest series of online conversations with sustainability activists. Our sessions are scheduled every Tuesday, every other Tuesday, I'm sorry, from here until the end of October. Um, the next one coming up will be October 2nd. And the theme is Reciprocal Impacts, Foodways and Environments with Dr. Rita Moonsami and guest Dr. Psyche williams Forson. Dr. Moonsami is teaching our food and foodways course this semester. And Dr. Williams Forson is a scholar and an author who explores African American food culture and history in such uh, books that she's written as Eating While Black, Food Shaming and Race in America, and Building Houses Out of Chicken Legs, Black Women, Food and Power. That sounds just sounds great. I'm dying to, to see that one. Then on October 17th, um, our, our theme is culturally relevant health care, health care delivery with um, Max alumni Cecilia Ottenweller, who will facilitate a conversation with another Max alumni, Valicia Louise, and um, Dr. Andrea Karakostas. Valicia is a doula and a certified health um, education specialist in Baltimore. And Dr. Kara Costas is the CEO of the Asian Health Coalition doing business as Hope Clinic in Houston. So that sounds really, that's going to be a really fun dialogue between practitioner and, um, and healthcare provider. I think that's going to be interesting. And then October 24th, we will be offering an information session about our graduate program, the MA in Cultural Sustainability. So if you wanna learn more about the courses that we offer, about the faculty who work with our students and the kinds of careers that our students uh, create for themselves and achieve, then please join us then. And Taylor um, Seitzinger, who is our graduate student advice, graduate admissions advisor, is gonna put a couple of links in the chat. One is the link to our program, if you wanna explore that. And the other is a link to the page that lists all of the upcoming events, online free events um, that all the graduate programs are offering this fall. So feel free to sign up now so you can get them all on your calendar. So tonight's theme is arts and social change. And it's also the title of a course that we do offer. And some of the students that are with us tonight um, are actually taking that course this semester. Uh, when faced with social injustices, including threats to survival, sustenance, or culture, 
humans often respond creatively by making art. Sometimes these arts draw on traditional cultural aesthetics and may represent the continued survival of defiant cultural art forms that refuse to be extinguished. Other times they take on a more innovative or even radical nature, emerging as new innovative ways that artists are working with communities. No, I'm sorry, emerging as new practices or expressions. So during this conversation, I skipped a line, we will explore some innovative ways that artists are working with communities to facilitate, to facilitate change and empower agency. So we do have a guest with us, but we do. Well, we also hope that you all will bring your own experiences to this conversation. Our guest is Selena Morales. She is a Philadelphia-based public folklorist who consults nationally with a focus on urban folklore and the intersection of community aesthetics, heritage, and social justice. She is the lead folklorist for the Southwest Folklife Alliance PAR Network, which is a program that brings a folklorist lens to participatory action research that opens up space for creativity, community well being, self determination social change, radical imagination, and racial justice. From 2014 to 2022, she was on the faculty here in the MA program in cultural sustainability, where she taught courses on cultural partnerships, nonprofit leadership and management, and she taught the arts and social change course. So makes perfect sense that she is a guest speaker for us tonight. Selena earned a BA in anthropology at Oberlin College and an MA in folklore at Indiana University in Bloomington. So um, that is my introduction. Welcome everybody. Welcome Selena. So looking forward to um, our conversation tonight. Thanks, Amy. Thank you everybody. Uh, blushing a lot about the comments about me in the chat. Appreciate you all appreciating me. Um, it is awesome to be here today. As Amy shared, I am former faculty in the MAX uh, program, and I really enjoyed my time teaching at MAX. I will say one thing that I miss about it a lot and something I valued while I was a teacher there uh, was the opportunity to think with other people in real time about the work that I was doing in the world. And so I would take knotty problems and issues that I was encountering in my work, whether that was at the Philadelphia Folklore Project or um, in other, other venues um, uh, through my consulting and would think about them with the students and the faculty during the residencies. And um, my work advanced very much. A lot of my thinking and, and doing are grounded in the ideas circulating through the MAX program. And so for that, I'm appreciative of my time there and I'm appreciative of my time now with you all as a chance to think about something that I'm doing right now today um, and would love to, to, you know, sort of stir the pot um, after I've, I've presented a bit of, uh, of what's going on in my mind right now. So thanks for being here. And to those of you that I know and I'm seeing your faces on the video, I just warming my heart to be connected to you all at this time. So I'm going to look at the time because I'm a talker, just noting, I'm going to try to um, to ground us all right now in just a little bit of theory, um, some ideas that I hold really close to me as I try to work in a space that is at the intersection of um, grassroots arts and social justice. And we can call that a lot of different ways. We can say folk arts and social change. You can say community-based arts and racial justice. They're all ways that traditional, community-grounded, um, uh, grassroots creativity uh, interact with the social need for transformation in a lot of different kinds of venues. So uh, I'm going to talk tonight about two inspiring thinkers who you all may be very familiar with already, or this may be an introduction to them. And I'm just gonna give just a tiny, tiny little pinch 
of some ideas that they have that are lodged in my mind as I do my work. I've been extremely inspired and challenged by the writing of Grace Lee Boggs and one of her mentees, Adrian Marie Brown. These are two activists who have written extensively um, in order to wake people up and call people together to use art, creativity, and imagination to quote, ideate revolution and freedom. So I wanted to bring a little bit of their wisdom into our conversation as a way to frame my own work as a folklorist who is committed to social justice. And I also want to highlight an impactful project that I've been facilitating that draws on their theories of art and activism. So I'm gonna share some um, slides because I'll be delivering some quotes from them. And I just want you to be able to see them in writing. Um, and uh, this will be shared in the video as well. So you can come back to them. So I'll read these to you in a moment. You don't have to, to read right now. Um, but I wanna say that Grace Lee Boggs, um, she lived to be a hundred years old. She passed away a little while ago. And um, in her 90th year, uh, wrote an incredible text, um, uh, The Next American Revolution uh, with the help of Scott Kershiga. And in the text, she really talks about how the social conditions of today, planetary emergency, the prison industrial complex, the imperative of racial justice in the face of systemic racism, really call for a new way of living. And her call for that new way of living has me very curious and is something that I like to think with, a tool for thinking. Here are two other things that she says. We need to embrace the idea that we are the leaders that we have been looking for. And my question for that is, what does that mean in practice? How do we embrace this idea? And the second is comes from this great YouTube video, uh, an interview that she did um, shortly before she passed. And in it, she says, I see the signs of this hope for a new way of living in small groups that are emerging all over the place to try to regain our humanity in very practical ways. So I've highlighted this idea myself of to re regain our humanity in very practical ways. That's the piece I'm trying to hold. For example, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Will Allen has purchased a half acre plot with five greenhouses on it, and he is beginning to grow food for his community. Communities are growing up around that idea. But just pause there, right? Like kids are seeing food grown right in front of them. I mean, that has a huge change, or that is a huge change in the way that we think of the city. I mean, the things that we have to restore are so I'm elemental. Confused, but I hope my my job don't. Oh, hold on. Um, Daishana, if you could mute, please. The things that we have to restore are so elemental, not just food and not just healthy food, but a different way of relating to time and history, related differently to earth, to elders. So I really hear that as a call to pay attention to the very practical everyday mechanisms that can help restore us to community. And so it is from this quote and from the need to embrace the idea that we are the leaders we've been looking for that I'm building some questions around how to practice. Um, I also wanna say that one of the things that Grace Lee Boggs argues in her book, The Next American Revolution, is that over the past few decades, 
social, and this is really, you know, she's writing about 10 years ago now, um, but I still find these things to be true in the grassroots movements that I'm a part of, um, that in the past few decades of social justice organizing, big victories have been prioritized over small collaborative actions that build communities and neighborhoods. That is that the end has been valued over the means and that has been a major failure of social movements over the decades. She says, we urgently need to bring our communities the limitless capacity of love, serve, sorry, the limited capacities to love, serve and create for and with each other. So again, holding these charges from Grace Lee Boggs, these challenges that say, what are the small everyday things that we need to do with one another in order to create a new world that we don't yet know? And the imperative to center these limitless resources that we already have in community, love, service, creativity, and one another. So that's what I'm holding from Grace Lee Box. The theory part's almost over. There's just a teeny little bit more. Then we're gonna put that in conversation with Adrienne Marie Brown. Many of you may have heard of her. She um, is a prolific author and uh, movement leader. And she's uh, written a book called Emergent Strategy, Shaping Change and Changing Worlds. Um, and so just to give you a sense of what she means by emergent strategy. I've written her definition out here at the top of the slide, which I'll read to you. Emergent strategy is a humble philosophy and a way to acknowledge the real power of change. It speaks to practices, responses, visions, and plans that embrace complexity, interdependence, and transformation. This strategy has been observed from the natural world and is, a, is both ancient and constant. Pick up the book if this sounds good to you. I'm not going to get deeply into it, but what I wanted to tell you is that she identifies a list of elements of her strategy, right? The idea of emergence, the thing that is growing and changing, and it is a strategy. It is a, a plan and a mechanism for doing something. And the very first element that she names is, is fractals. And what she means by fractals is that there is a relationship between the small and the large. And she boils that down even further, deeper in the book, to this great, beautiful, small statement, which is small is all. The idea that what we do on the small scale, of course, is what happens on the large scale. There's this great Annie Dillard quote where she says, how you spend your days is, of course, how you spend your life. I love that. And I find that like relevant here is that the small things we do in community are in fact what make change on a large scale. So holding these ideas from both Adrian Brown and Grace Lee Boggs, I am, and when I taught this course, the Art and Social Change at Max, um, this is a question that I asked the students and what I'm doing tonight is trying to challenge myself to answer it. What might a grassroots community revolution look like in practice? Right, these are these individuals are both calling for that. And um, I'm somebody that had just said to you a few minutes ago, I have dedicated my career to uh, working with, with grassroots arts and, and social change. So what is the revolution? What can it look like? Where does it start? What are the pieces that you put together? And so um, I thought we would just take a quick look um, at a project that I'm working on with the Southwest Folklife Alliance to um, see how things might be beginning, because I don't know where they're headed, but I can talk about where they are right now. Uh, these images that I'm sharing are by Kate Morales. You'll see a bunch more in a bit. Uh, we're not related, but we love each other very much. And um, these are images that she helped to create for this project that we're working on. I thought they were sweet pictures of people beginning their revolutions. So I'm going to shift how I'm sharing my screen. So look away if that makes you dizzy. 
Okay. All right. Amy, can you just give me a thumbs up if you can see this website? Okay. I'm going to use the Southwest Folklife Alliance um, Folklife PAR Network website instead of making a PowerPoint since it's all visually laid out here anyway. Um, this project began three years ago uh, with the purpose of activating artists embedded in community to create structural change in the face of racial injustice. The project was uh, started and funded by the Cerdna Foundation out of New York City, and the actual official title of the, pro of the overall project is the Radical Imagination for Racial Justice Project or initiative. Um, the Southwest Folklife Alliance is part of a consortium of uh, organizations that were um, granted uh, funds through the Cerdna Foundation to implement this strategy a strategy of resourcing artists to create structural change that will move the needle on racial justice issues identified by community members. And at the SFA, the Southwest Folklife Alliance, our role in that very large charge was to train community members throughout the country in um, utilizing a, a research methodology called participatory action research or PAR. And as a group of folklorists, we brought our folk life lens to the implementation of participatory action research. And um, again, coming back to my like, my major research question is, or my major thinking question, I wouldn't necessarily call it research, is, uh, you know, how are we, how are we doing this? How are we going to get this work done together? So the first answer to that is we're going to do it together. So I just wanted to introduce you quickly um, to some of the people across the country, from San Juan to San Francisco, and in all the, in between, who are um, incredible, skilled artists who are committed right now to connecting with their communities to learn together, right? Zora Neale Hurston tells us that research is simply formalized curiosity. And so they are organizing their curiosity into a, into a form that makes sense to their community, right? So they're drawing on their folk traditions and their community knowledge and their grassroots understanding of learning in order to shape how they go about um, knowing with one another, questioning with one another, being curious with one another. And so I, like, that's like level one, that's what these folks are doing. I'm just gonna scroll so you can see all their beautiful faces. We have a National Heritage Award winner, um, Veronica Castillo, who's working with us, um, as well as several other incredible, incredible artists. And, um, like at the first level related to like my curiosity around Grace Lee Boggs' is, is charge is what is it to practice curiosity with one another, right? We have these amazing artists who can make stuff, but the first thing they're doing is um, building and developing the muscle of curiosity and wonder in their communities and really they're, they've been given the space and the time and the training. Uh, my role in this work is to do the training, to sit with that curiosity and, um, and find ways to weave it into the fabric of being in community with one another. But they haven't even gotten to the art part yet. It's really just grounded in the beginning. It's trust, relationship building, being with one another and then arriving at a place where it's safe to be curious. There's a lot of kind of multi-layered aspects to this work. And so I'm really just focusing on kind of one pathway to explain it, understand it, but it's for sure something that you're welcome to ask questions about as we move forward. And um, we'll put the website in the chat in case you wanna explore it in a different way after um, this session. Uh, I think this is a nice statement here. 
When we pay attention to folk life, we pay attention to the creative ways that people act in community, make meaning together and express their collective ethics, morals, and values. That's exactly, I think, what Grace Lee Boggs is talking about without using the word folk life. And I think for that reason, a lot of people in my field, which is the field of folklore, have often used Grace Lee Boggs' theory because they connect so, it connects so naturally to our understanding of what grassroots culture is doing on a social level. To use a folk life strategy in participatory action research is to center community identified important cultural expressions. The tools and principles used in a folk life strategy help practice and fortify critical community processes, which we believe build towards liberation and self-determination and shift power to everyday people. And so I'm gonna scroll kind of quickly, but through some of the images that we use in our trainings that you can immediately see are demonstrating through an artistic lens some of the core values, ethics, and principles of the practice, right? Intergenerational learning while doing. Being in the round. Being responsive. Innovating. Emerging. Observation. sharing aesthetic principles through critical life cycles. Having ethics that ground your work. Understanding yourself as a researcher, understanding yourself with agency, self-determination. Recognizing that ways of knowing are valuable and valued in the community. And just the critical role of folk life um, in community uh, knowledge building. So um, I'm gonna take, I think two minutes, Amy, to just dive into a little project quickly, if that feels okay to you. Each of the PAR fellows, the individuals that I showed you that are part of this network have been leading projects in their community. And we have, um, this is a, this website is a living uh, learning lab for them. Um, right here, we have three of our projects are named, um, but we have, uh, I think 12 projects going at the moment. And when those projects are ready, they will, reveal themselves here. <laughs> we also have a blog where each of the um, participants write about the relationship between art and research. Um, but I wanted to just dive in a little bit to the project in San Francisco, which is called Somos Esenciales. And it's focused on looking at the problem of the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on the Latinx community living in the Mission District of San Francisco. The project was run by a spoken word artist and um, professor of theater and playwright, uh, Paul Flores. And he partnered with a um, community activist, lawyer and writer, Adriana Camarena, to investigate this question through both his arts and through her investigative um, journalism practice. And what they did was they gathered um, members of their community who were volunteering at a food pantry that opened up during COVID. And um, they interviewed one another, you can see in some of these um, photos, asking one another how COVID impacted them. And then when they learned how, that, how it was impacting them, they asked questions about that. And when they learned the answers to those questions, they asked more questions. And basically they just built a culture of curiosity and wonder with one another and the longer they did this cycle, the more they each developed a role as a leader in their community, as someone who was gathering data and had new knowledge that they were producing about the impact of the pandemic on their people. And I can't even speak enough about this project and the kinds of impacts that it's had. Um, I'm just showing you some quick photos so you can get a sense of what a project looked like. 
what ended up happening um, from an artistic perspective, and I'll put a video in the chat. Um, I don't that we didn't have enough certainty that the video would show well, so I'm not going to share it with you tonight. But there was a documentary film made about this process of leadership building in the community. But there was also um, tes testimony given to these researchers. There were 10 of them, and each of them interviewed at least 10 people. There were more than 150 people interviewed during this time about their uh, experience with COVID, one, and two, what traditional or community-based arts practices supported them while they were struggling during the pandemic and especially during the, um, the lockdown. And they took the testimonies that they gathered and they turned them into a play. The play has now been um, uh, performed for healthcare providers at the local universities, for the city council members, for members of the Latino Task Force, which is a group of um, government and non-government supporters of Latino health and wellness in San Francisco, who've gotten together to pay attention to the issue of Latino wellness in the city. They've seen the play and they've been facilitated in dialogues um, by these community researchers. Um, lots of funds have come into the community as a result of these artistic interventions that are supporting some of the core issues that were identified during the research. And it goes on and on and on. This group has now been requested to um, take on new roles in their community, both official and unofficial, because of the skills that they built. And I'm thinking about this project um, it's much more complicated than I have the time to express right now. Um, but I'm thinking about Grace Lee Boggs and her question, this small is all, what kind of world are th have these individuals created for themselves um, through simply the practice of making art to make change, right? They identified what that might mean for them. They pursued a lot of different strategies, which I can talk about in the Q&A if people are curious. And then actually are um, living in a new existence as a result of this time that they've spent together. Um, and I think I'll, I'll just stop there, uh, Amy, and I'll put a couple links in the chat for folks who are curious more about Somos Essenciales and that project. There's a film that's on the film festival circuit now that it's about it, um, and lots of other ways to connect, which again, I'll put in the chat, but that's, those, that's my little case study for tonight. And thank you. Thank you so much, Selena. That's, that's great. It's a, it's a lot. There's a lot there, isn't there? Um, I, there was a lot that I could resonate with. Um, and um, trying to think where to where to start. Um, I really appreciate that you started with Grace Lee Boggs, and I think one of the one of the things that struck me in her. Um, in her book is this notion of um, that we need to continue to exercise our collective imagination, right? That, that our, our collective imagination muscle, right? And I love this idea of um, imagination as a muscle, as something that needs to continually be exercised, practiced, worked on, and I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that, especially maybe in light of the exam, the case study that you just gave or or a different case study. Is there, I mean, I think it, it also reverberates with um, um, Adrienne Marie Brown's notion of emergent strategies, taking time and requiring patience and, and then connects to PAR as a research methodology that takes time. It doesn't happen quickly. So I'm just wondering if you could reflect a little bit on that, that, um, yeah. that idea of the imagination muscle. I just think that's such a great, um, um, I don't know, metaphor, I guess, for how we stay creative, how we stay curious. Yeah. I love that question. Thank you, Amy. And I think um, one of the ways that we do that in our training uh, I work alongside Nelda Ruiz, who is uh, also a PAR practitioner based at the Southwest Folklife Alliance. And um, what Nelda and I have really honed in on is uh, taking the time <laughs> mm -hmm. and really allowing for the space of imagination to unfold. 
but we have an assignment that we give our um our we call them our par fellows the individuals who have um identified themselves as artists and leaders in their community who want to lead the par effort um and that assignment is to think about a tradition that is important in their community Mm-hmm. And they talk about it with us. They identify it. We together on Zoom talk about the textures of that tradition. And then we talk about who has knowledge about that tradition. They come up with a long list of people who, who know something, anything about the tradition. And then they have to pick one of the people on that list and they have to ask them a question about the tradition. So firstly, It sounds very simple, but in the beginning of that session, we are talking about everything that we know. And often the folks that we're working with are talk, they have a lot of knowledge about a tradition in their community, especially a favorite one that comes to mind at the top of their, you know, top of the head. And then we challenge them to say, what do you want to know about it? What do you wonder about this tradition? And then they pick the person often happens pretty much every time that they think knows the most about that thing. Right. And then we challenge them to ask that person, what do they wonder about that tradition? And I really want to say that in that process, there is something that's activated in the imagination because you not only are realizing that there's like important knowledge in your community and it's important to take time to learn, but you're also recognizing that nobody holds all, all of it. And that um, it is really in that, in that, need to learn and to grow that I think imagination can be activated within the context of social change. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I think that there is a major role for artists, of course, and being imaginative people and creative people. But I want to think just specifically about this pedagogy and how when you invite people to wonder about something they think they know so well and that they often do know so well, um, it, I think, opens up a window for being able to imagine, innovate, emerge, um around that issue or that topic or that art form whatever it is yeah wow that's really that's great I love that I love that process of um asking and then you know asking what you wonder and then going to the other person and asking what they wonder and realizing that nobody holds all the knowledge which I think reinforces the importance of community in order to maintain the significance and the meaning of that tradition in the first place, right? If if everybody has a different sort of understanding of that tradition, it's the collective understanding that actually gives it its, you know, the depth of its value or meaning in that community. So I, does that make yes, sense? Yes, for tradition and for social justice movement yeah. organized, right? Yeah. There's, yeah. There's, there's not one person who can hold it all. Yeah. And in, in many cases, the that holder of tradition, you know, in, in some of these communities that we've worked with have, has never been asked, what do you mm-hmm. want to know? What do you wonder? Yeah. How do you learn? Mm-hmm. Um, because they're seen as the holder of the knowledge. And so I think it also breeds, uh, it builds this muscle of intercommunity curiosity and safety in not knowing and not holding, which is really like pushes up against the dominant paradigm of like, I know all or anyone has to hold everything at any time. And so it's these little moments. That's where I keep coming back to these questions about this grassroots revolution. If I'm having in my day, 10 new moments every day where I'm being curious with somebody, what does that do for my expectation about what the world is? Um, and I think that that's a good question for children. It's also a great question for elders, for all of us, for everyone in between. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and, you know, it makes me think about the example that you did give and the theater production um, that brought healthcare providers, you know, and I, you might remember I did a similar one with refugee and immigrant women um, looking at cultural collisions in healthcare, and we brought in also insurance providers, health insurance providers, and you know we want that art that art form to impact that. I mean, so here's another thing to think about in terms of this idea of small is all, right? Because we want these theater pieces 
to like impact the way those doctors treat them or impact, you know, we want them to impact the healthcare system, which is this huge behemoth that is so challenging to impact. And that might not happen and it might not even happen for 20 years, but what are all of the other things that have happened? I think you alluded to this in, you know, when you showed this, showed the pictures of the people that had worked on that and what, how had their life changed? You know, it might not be that the doctor pays better attention right, right away, right? But what are the other ways that their lives have changed by being part of this process, by being, by creating this sense of, of community or this sense of purpose in the work that they're doing? That make yeah, sense? and I, there has to be multiple strategies, you know, happening simultaneously, right? This isn't mm -hmm. the only approach, but I think what I'm um, working through right now as I'm talking about it to you all and as I'm writing about it, about the work um, the, and the methodologies that we're developing um, and the pedagogy um, is like what role does this Pra like community embedded practice have in really um, implementing systems change, um, you know, and and that's been the challenge from the Serna Foundation to uh, particularly the vision of Javier uh, Campos Torres, but the um, idea that that arts have a role to play in systems change and that community leadership like spread out across the community is critical for bolstering that artist's practice. It's like, it's a complicated kind of web of vision that the Serdina Foundation put out. And again, the Southwest Folklife Alliance is working on a corner of it. But from what I have seen over the last three years of implementing the, the PAR and Folklife strategy um, is that the artists that are working with community members in this capacity are working from a very strong foundation, right? Um, when I've taught this class in the past, I've often kind of put at odds, um, social practice, like social practice arts and community-based arts. And to think about the nuance between the differences, do um, the nuances and the difference between these uh, being the artist's vision coming in and saying, I'm going to engage with you and the community building their practice together and then inviting an artist to innovate or imagine on their priorities. With and it almost doesn't like matter what things are called or, or sort of what the canon is, but there has historically been a distinct approach that has been taught in schools um, in, like in master's programs or MFAs around what like a socially engaged artist does and what they can expect from community in the long term. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, no, I love that distinction. Yeah. I so see Laura. Laura. Has, yeah. Laura has her hand up. And then um, I think we'd love to hear from some of the others of you. We have a couple questions to ask you all. So Laura. Uh, yeah. I love getting away from culture as a thing and reframing it as like an emergence, as like a active living thing. And I had a wondering around more like the logistic pieces of the PAR fellows and in the spirit of that sustainability and like that web you were just talking about, like how long is the fellowship? Um, what does the application process look like? I'm just really curious a little bit about like how long does the PAR fellow get supported by this agency and you know where how how that can I, I guess change over time in like five ten years as we talk about emergence and sustainability too uh yeah thanks for your question laura um i this is like a really dreamy project i've never been in i've been i've been working in the nonprofit space for a very long time and I have never had a project that is funded in this kind of way and really built on the principle of trust between the foundation and the organization that is receiving the funds to bring into community. And so I just wanna note that it's like 
it's unlike anything I've ever participated in and that I've ever seen since um, it started. It doesn't feel like it's part of a trend in the nonprofit world or in the foundation arts funding world. Um, but basically, the CERNA Foundation gave the Southwest Folklife Alliance and many other organizations in their portfolio $1.3 million and said, we trust you. This is the theory we're working with. See how it goes. And then our, in the spirit of that practice, we um, partnered with the National Association for Latino Arts and Culture, NALAC, and said, the artists that you choose to work with to activate, to make structural change, um, are welcome to participate, to apply to participate in our PAR program. And we will evaluate their participation. The year one, we actually just had a conversation with them. We're like, is this really what you want to do? If the answer was yes, they were in. The second year, we had almost 200 applications for people who wanted to do it, and we were able to pick six. So I don't think either approach was the right approach. <laughs> but at the same time, we ended up with really just incredible artist leaders who were ready to like stand arm in arm with their community um, in, in the face of racial justice issues that they were facing directly as Latinos, um, you know, intersectional Latinos in all over the, the country. Um, and then the way it works with us, we do, you know, this is, there's a, actually a great podcast, the Emergent Strategy podcast, um, that's part of the Emergent Strategy Ideation Institute. And there's a, a episode of it that is called Liberatory Logistics. And it's really like this con commitment, you know, the the person who um, is interviewed that day, I can't remember who it is, but I make all my park fellows listen to it. It's this idea of like, how do you create a logistical processes that have liberation at the center? And so when we're budgeting with our par fellows, you know, we say to them, you have $25,000 and we expect for you during this time to learn about how to be curious with your people, to lead them in that process and um, to in a blog post of however length, or if you can speak it out and we'll transcribe it, just tell us about why it was meaningful. And, you know, they attend trainings with us by choice and they, um, you know, we have go through a participatory budgeting process with them so that they can then do that in their communities. Um, so we try as much as we can to have the logistics of participating in this be as um, ethically grounded as possible. And again, that is really, and so that's paying everybody up front. Nobody has like, no one, you know, if someone ends up not doing the research, you know, we've invested in their learning and that will forever, forever impact their communities. And we really believe that. And that is like the North star. So um, again, it's like a very dreamy situation I've not been in before, but I advocate for it. Beautiful. Thank you. I put the podcast in the chat so hopefully yeah thank you thanks for doing about. that so um i didn't write them down we have a couple of questions for you all what are some ways that um oh john well john put his hand up and then john did you have a question yeah i mean sorry i put it down because you seemed like you were about to go on a roll um we're going to ask yeah, questions Selena, of just, you all. But go ahead. Fair enough. Um, Selena, I just wanted to ask you to expand a little bit, if you could, on one of the um, comments you just made, which is, I really like the, the phrasing that you just used of finding logistical processes with justice at the center, if I'm quoting you correctly. Um, and it really struck me that that's a good way to talk about the... Um, processes that, that you were talking about with Amy in terms of um, how the uh, artists are encouraged to speak to their elders about things they're curious about. Um, are there any other like examples of such processes in this fellowship or in any of your other work that you think are particularly, I don't know, illuminating? Yeah, uh, totally. And I don't know, I'm not sure where I would start, but I will say like on a different scale and a different context, um, a while ago, I was the director of a nonprofit organization here in Philadelphia, the Philadelphia Folklore Project. 
And um, I, one of my kind of what I would consider my legacy at the organization, um, I would consider have considered it that then. I don't know about now, <laughs> but it's something I'm very proud of. Is what I want to say is that I completely revamped the HR policy. You know, and I know that's like not what you were expecting to hear, but I just I think that thinking about infrastructure and humanity <laughs> and how we can build organizations, how we can build movements, how we can build community practice, how we can build our artistic practice in ways that center people and wellness and move the needle on what we can expect from one another, how we treat each other and how we expect to be treated is really, really important. So liberatory logistics and participatory budgeting on a small scale for a project that's $25,000 is a way to practice that so that when your city budget or your town budget comes out and you say, wait, where was my voice in that practice? You can say, I know what a line item is. I know how to read a budget. I know that there's been change here over time. I can see how the story of what I'm experiencing is, is um, echoed in the story of these numbers. So it's all, to me, practice for a much bigger movement and a, a shift um, that is required of all of us. So again, back to that small is all principle. Um, but yeah, the organizational stuff has been really, really critical for me, John, um, in learning you know, the, folk, the Philadelphia Folklore Project, this mission is, or this tagline was folk arts and social change since 1987. And one of the questions that I brought to it, what, to the organization when I was there, I was there for a decade, was how do these internal capacities that we and infrastructures that we have set up for ourselves mirror the kind of world that we want to be living in? And that's really, really hard to do within the context of the nonprofit industrial complex, right? It is not set up to, um, to answer that call. But um, what are the ways that we can make small shifts? And there's lots of resistance all along the way and the shifts aren't big enough and the dollars don't match, but we still have to be committed to naming what it is we want, naming the world we wanna live in. As I recall, one of the other things you did is everybody had January to go rejuvenate. Yeah. Yeah, I always January thought that was so that. brilliant. Yeah, everybody had a sabbatical in January, to, not in not in the you know higher ed sense, but in the sense of go breathe and and read and whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, I think one of the things that's so brilliant about this and that is inspiring about um bugs and Murray Brown is is this notion of small and of you know and you know that because sometimes it's really overwhelming to look at that huge behemoth corporate you know corporate globalization complex and and imagine trying to change it but but you know what but what's inspiring about all of this is is to doing it that it can and you know margaret mead is the one that said you know don't uh i don't know the oh gosh i don't have the quote in the top of my head but never doubt for a single moment that a small group of people can't make change it's the only thing that's ever it's the only way change has ever happened right so um you know i think this sort of reflects that but i think i'm curious if any of you have examples of of ways that you are um, using your, you know, flexing your imagination muscle to um, engage with, you know, small groups in your own communities to, to, to at least, you know, resist, right? Resist. And, um, and even in resisting, you know, we begin to shift where attention is, right? So any examples from any of you that you want to share? Yeah, Raina, go ahead. Um, first, uh, thanks so much, Selena. Uh, it's really awesome, really, really awesome. Uh, we had actually looked at the um, uh, at the Folk Life Bar Network in uh, in class over the summer, and it was just so amazing to get like this deeper perspective on 
on it. I'm really grateful for that. Um, yeah, I mean, and I'll just say, like, I was thinking a lot uh, when you were talking about this idea of uh, Grace Lee Boggs talking about Small is All, about this conversation between Maribel Alvarez and Jason Bullock, where they talk about that connection between the way that folklorists study, like what Maribel Alvarez, I think, talks about, the, calls the little stuff or something, or the small stuff. Um, and how like so much um, power and agency comes out of those things. And uh, and I was recently listening to uh, Benji Hart talk uh, about this idea uh, about safety, you know, especially for trans people and trans people of color um, of like, look, you know, look at what's already working and figure out how to resource that more um and uh, they talk about for example like if you know crashing on your sister's couch is like a critical resource like how do we put more resources into housing um you know if there's a space where you know people are doing um you know arts events like you know how how do we resource spaces like that more and make that more possible so i mean that's a big part of what i'm trying to do uh with luminous arts this organization that i founded in 2020 and one one of the things that I just thought of Amy when you asked that question was um you know I I just noticed over time that like um that like DJing forms this really critical practice for trans people not just as a way of making money but definitely as like one of the consistent places where trans people have access to like uh financial income but also as a way of thinking about structure uh, and thinking about how, like, uh, what tracks you put together. It is also, like, models kind of ways that, like, uh, ideas about norms and categories can be challenged. Um, so we, you know, we uh, have a set of, like, DJ equipment in, in our offices, and we have, like, open calls um, where, like, trans and non-binary people can come and use the equipment for free, uh, they can record themselves. We have pizza afterwards, or if they don't eat pizza, we have sort of share some other kind of food. Um, and uh, so the first wave of that was last year, and it was like bringing one person at a time, which is really amazing. But we're expanding it now to bringing multiple people in at the same time, so that it also develops this community building and skill share, and also like um, you know, thinking a lot about like you know, and this idea that I think comes up a lot of like, we'll go to the community and ask what they need and like the additional challenges for trans community because there's not like a place you can go. There's not like a neighborhood or there's not like a part of the city or there's not, you know, there's like, there's not a place. I'm trying to build that place actually. It's what I'm trying to do is actually build yeah. that place. Um, but yeah, but um, so that like, you know, bringing people together who have like, who are in different scenes and stuff, you know, like has this additional value um, anyway, that's that's I talked for a long time, so I'm gonna pass. That's great. That's uh, I mean, I think uh, you know, creating space for people to express themselves is is really powerful, even if it's one person at a time. Yeah, Kieran, did you want to add something? Yeah, sorry, I moved spot because there was a a bee. Where I was a bee, a, a oh, small no. bee that made change in me, made me move away. <laughs> 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 it shifted this body. Yeah, um, it's not really a question, but it's really a comment about this idea that um, the you know the you know the the power of the you know the small, and I think that's really important in in social change work in because it it can become really overwhelming for people. The world is so big. The war in Ukraine is so, what can I do? You know, the uh, issues we're facing in Appalachia, in the South, in across this nation, it's so overwhelming for the, but I, and I really like that because the approach means that it's tangible for people. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And I think it, I think that's really important. I think the, mm -hmm. um, something that we can grasp and we can look towards and we can look at, we see the beauty even in despair within the spaces that we live and we walk every day so i just want to comment on that i think within the peace building um even in the peace building world and just offering hope which is so important in this offering some type of hope the tangibility i think is really important and i think um, the application for this for how we tackle those bigger 
systems and and helping to uh, communicate that to like the bigger peace building international development i think this has a lot of validity and 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 thank you yeah i, I want to just I totally, say one, Amy, yeah go ahead on. yeah go ahead please thing before we sign off tonight um I, th I think, but um, the small is important. Yes, small is all. I think that's a great idea. I think it's it's that married with the kind of everyday practical um, being with one another um, and thinking, wow, how is my everyday life significant? Well, it's significant because it's small and because the way that we go about, you know, building our creativity in everyday life is critical for the bigger picture. But I do like the big picture. I just want to like say that the other direction does have a role to play. And um, I'll say that like for the Somos Essenciales project, like the National Institute of Health and the National Endowment for the Humanities and San Francisco, um, the University of San Francisco are all like, and their entire department of psychology is like interested in what these people have learned in community in order to make uh, major systems change. Like, and that's necessary. And I don't know where any of that's headed. I don't want to speak out of turn. And this is sort of things that are out there in the ether right now. So I won't go into it, but that it's like to put these everyday people who are just trying to build their imagination muscles together and are noticing important things and deciding to take action on them, they are critical members of the big picture change that needs to happen in order to keep them and their neighbors safe. So I, I didn't want to like leave the impression that it's just like all about these small acts, but it is it, it I'm really hyper focused on the small acts uh, in my work. Yeah, I mean I think it it's that when those small acts are are cumulative, and when people begin to treat each other more humanely, you know, it, it it's the ripple effect, right? I mean, it's the, it's, um, it, you know, and then when you resist being treated poorly, um, then that begins to create change at at that bigger level. And and yeah, we, I mean, I, and I think it's going to take time. It's going to take a long time might not even happen in our lifetime that we have a more humane and just world. But any other comments or examples or questions anybody would like to? Um, yes, go Mallory. Good, nice to see you, Mallory. Um, so we will um, share this recording with all of you so that you can look at it again or review it or have it for yourselves. Um, and um, like I said, we have another one coming up in two weeks uh, that looks at, uh, that is Rita Moonsami speaking with uh, Dr. Psyche uh, Williams for some um, looking at uh, food justice and the, the interconnection between foodways and, and environments, plural. So, um, Selena, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to, to prepare to be with us and to ask such really fabulous, provocative, wonder, wonder filled questions. Um, I just really appreciate it. It's always a delight to have a conversation with you. So thank you. Thanks, Amy. Thank you, everybody. It was lovely to be here. Uh, great. Thank so you. um just have to say yeah. that beautiful group of humans and it's such a great community. Thank you, Amy and Selena and everyone. Just yeah, good people. Thank you, Mallory. You are definitely one of those people out there making change. I've seen it happen. So um, as I mentioned earlier, Taylor um, Seitzinger um, is our new graduate admissions counselor. I think we 
I don't know if you want to show your face, Taylor, but um, if anybody has questions about the program, um, Selena, I don't know if you want to put your email in the chat if people want to follow up with you. Um, we can certainly do that um, for questions, but here's some quick information for those of us at Goucher. If anybody needs to have contact information, please reach out. And there's there's Selena's um, there's Selena's address, email address. Okay, great. All right. Well, thank you all. And um, for my class, I'll see you next week. I'm sure we're going to have a really great conversation. We've got lots to catch up on. So, and the rest of you, it was really great to see you. And thanks again, Selena. Bye. Thank you.